The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Welcome back to the Retro Rangers podcast. I am your host, George Grimm. And I am happy to be uh, joined again by my two AARP uh, linemen, uh, Mark Weissman and Rich Isaac. And this evening, we're going to be talking about our, uh, our all-time favorite ranges, um, okay, gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks again, George, always. Good to be here. Okay. Now, when uh, when uh, Mark uh, brought this up as a topic, I thought, yeah, okay, no problem. But it was tough. Um, I ended up with 35 forwards and 10 defensemen and like <laughs> eight, eight forwards. And I had to cut that down a lot. So uh, there's a lot of... Lot of uh, a lot of uh, tough decisions and a lot of um, favorite players left off the list, but that's um, that's life. So, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Mark now. He's going to explain how we're going to do this, and then we'll go right into the uh, the, uh, the forwards. Right, okay, Mark. thanks, George um, and Rich. Uh, so basically, you know, the way George outlined it, it was. It seemed pretty straightforward, you know, who were your favorite players. Sometimes, of course, some of them are current, some of them are retired, some of them are, you know, you know, go way back, let's say. Um, so it seemed, but it seemed pretty straightforward. But the more we did it, it seemed like we realized that in some cases we all picked the same player, and then in other cases, you know, we each had our individual favorites for whatever reasons. So um, the way we're going to do this, is we're going to actually lead, we're going to start with the forwards. So we'll, we'll go with our favorite forwards over, you know, I would say the last, you know, 50, 60 years, whatever it is. And, uh, and then after we're done with the forwards, we move on to defensemen and then uh, goalies, of course. Uh, but we also are going to throw, hopefully throw in uh, general managers, coaches, announcers. Um, so I try to cover some other things because, you know, we obviously have our favorites when it comes to those categories too. Um, and then within each category, so for example, when we start forwards, we're first going to talk about the forwards that at least two of us picked. In other words, it could be all, it could be unanimous, or it could be, um, you know, two out of the three of us picked these forwards. And within all of the ones that are common, we're going to kind of go through those chronologically. So we'll go through all the common forwards or crossover forwards, as you could call it, uh, from you know the very first favorite to to more recent. And then we'll kind of jump back and talk about the specific one-offs, the, the unique forwards that um, that we picked, you know, that maybe nobody else picked. And, and that, you know, I would think that would spark some conversation too, because, um, you know, what what was it about that particular forward that you know made you pick them as a favorite? Things like that. So. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so. One of the forwards that uh, George and I have in common is uh, Walter Kachuk. Um, I know for me, one one of the things that I I found interesting about him about him right away is that uh, he was originally born in Germany, like my parents. Right. So that raised my interest, and I just liked the way he played. Was a big, rugged center. Could score, but excellent two-way player right now he was was he part of the bulldog line is that right yes he was yes. yeah i thought so i thought so okay uh the yeah. um the the uh, main thing i remember about walker Chuk is that when um the rangers were uh, scouting him um the ranger president uh bill jennings asked Emil francis what he did in the off season and apparently he ran uh he ran uh um um, down to uh, mines. He brought uh, uh, explosives down to mines. Wow. And, uh, and um, Bill Jennings said to Amo Francis, maybe we should get him a better job. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Well, I, my, I mean, I remember him more sort of late, probably towards the tail end of his career. And uh, right. he was he was like a, a just a, known at that point as a really solid checking forward. I mean, what you would consider right. a third, you know, I don't know, fourth line, because he could score, but I wouldn't necessarily think about four. But definitely, you know, that kind of guy who could be reliable, you know, at both ends of the ice and um, did good on draws from what I remember. I mean, it's been a while, but yeah. uh, things like that. So that's, you know, I think when he played with, what was it, Dave Ballone and was, was Vickers the other winger with him? I can't remember who the other winger was. was oh, with Billy Fairburn. Fairburn. Billy Fairburn, that's right. Um, and when, you know, they, they were more played scoring. with both Dave Ballone and Steve Vickers later. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, uh, you know, and that was, I think they were more offensive than, than what I remember when I watched Kachuk later. You know, he wasn't he wasn't playing with those types of players really as much. So uh, Well, uh, Ava Francis seemed to like to construct his lines where he had a strong center, a scoring wing, and a checking wing, or so he thought a checking wing. But, you know, in the case of the gag line, uh, Vic Hatfield wound up being a much better scorer than anybody ever thought he right. would be in the beginning. Yep. So. And actually, when you say that construct of a line, it also makes me think uh, Harry Sinton did the same thing with the Bruins when he had Espo, Cashman, and Hodge as a line. It was, it was kind of the same philosophy. Yeah. Um, and uh, which, of course, is why, you know, the idea was hopefully two of them would, would replicate in New York, which, you know, didn't really happen. But yeah. Um, but yeah, but it was well, the interesting like the thing. Philosophy there. The interesting thing about Kachuk was, Espo, when he was still in Boston, was always his defensive assignment, and oh. he was one of the few guys in the league big enough to go up against him, and was at least as strong as Espo. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. No. So he also he also had one of those unique helmets, didn't Kachuk wear a helmet almost like Robbie Fitorik, that kind of helmet? Yes. Yeah, I just remembered that as you were talking. Right. right. Okay. Who's next? So uh, that brings yeah. us to Kachuk yeah. scoring right. one. That works, Steve that worked out pretty good. Yeah, that worked out. Sarge. Yeah. Yeah, Vic is um, uh, was was a good scorer. He, they, they named him, I think Pete Semkowski named him Mr. 3.5 because that's as far as his shots went. Yeah, he, exactly. he, he he hung around by the post and knocked in uh, rebounds. And uh, and he could fight, too. I mean, uh, one of the Rangers scouts, scouts once said that Vickers doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't begin fights. He ends them. So um, he... he <laughs> He was he was a he was a good two way player. He was a, he was a um, he was a good ranger for a long time. Yep. And he he uh, changed his game too. Early on, when he was on on the bulldog line, he you know did a lot of scoring. But then towards the end of his career, um, he was more uh, um, you know of a checker. Right. Exactly. Yep. And I always yep. liked him because. Uh, it, you know, at the time he played, you know, we're the same age, and and we were uh, the same age. Uh, you know, I was a little taller than him, but he had better hair than I do, and uh, <laughs> and, um, and I could always see myself uh, standing down there by the post, knocking in rebounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in a way, he's a lot like, or he was a lot like Kreider um, in the sense, you know, where he played. You know, he was net front basically. But I, but I, I don't recall Vickers having as many deflections or tipping. Maybe he did, but he was more like you say. I remember constantly shot, rebound, Vickers score. You know that kind of thing, right outside the post. Yeah. That was his office. You know that kind of thing. So I definitely remember that. And he's yeah. got a couple things that jump. I remember when I hear his name, he scored. I think it's still a record. He scored the quickest overtime goal in the playoffs. I think for the Rangers, it was like 33 seconds against the Atlanta Flames. I remember being in my brother's room. And we turned the game on on the radio, and all of a sudden it was like over. You know, it was it was just quick. And yeah. uh, I don't know if that's been broken since then, but I remember at one point. And of course, he won Rookie of the Year. He was the last Rookie of the Year before Leach won it. Um, so uh, you know, he had that. He had two consecutive hat tricks once, right? Two two straight games with hat tricks. I remember that record. And I also right. met him. I, I went to Yonkers. What is it? Empire Raceway, Empire yeah. Casino. Sorry, Empire Casino. 
and he had there was a view uh, like a viewing party and a meet up with him. Really nice guy. Had some really good stories to tell about every you know. And we actually you know we, there was like a few of us and him watching a game. You know there was a game on away game on the, on the TVs, and he's just uh, he just was just you know a real regular guy. You know chatting with everybody. It was really cool. Yep. Okay. Who's next? So Rich, did you, Rich, did you have any comments on Vickers, or any, no, like, I, he was your favorite? No, well, same thing. You know, he was the compliment to Kachuk and Fairburn, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a good checker. And as you suggested, you know, he was the guy who hung around the net mm -hmm. and picked up the loose change, mm -hmm. you know, cleaned up the garbage, you know. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that brings us to Pete Stemkowski. Yep. Stemkowski is, is, is very much like, uh, several players that, uh, Emil Francis b brought to the Rangers. Stemkowski won a cup with Toronto in 66, 67, then got traded to Detroit. And the Rangers picked him up from Detroit, and he was a very important player in the Rangers' early 70s team because mm -hmm. he centered mm -hmm. their third line, their checking line with Teddy Irvin and Bruce McGregor. Right. And, of course, yeah. he scored one of the most important right. goals in, yeah, exactly. in playoff yeah. history yep. in triple yep. overtime. Yep. Yeah. He was basically Matteau before there was Matteau. <laughs> All right. And I can remember listening to that game on the radio, listening to Marv Albert make the call, because there was, where we lived in Jersey at that time, there was no no Rangers on cable TV. No, no. Right, yep, yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, and what's, it, what's cool is when you see the highlight of that goal, it's always it's Marv's call over the TV, which obviously is not how it was broadcast. But you know somebody smartly did that. You know, merge the audio yeah. and the video so you could hear it the way Marv called it. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like like Howie Rose's call for the Matteo goal. Right. Exactly. That's right. Almost That's right. all the videos are that call. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that game. I was at that game, and uh, and in the uh, the uh, second overtime period. The Rangers almost lost it because um, I think it was uh, Makita came in on uh, Eddie Jockman and he, and he hit him square in the mask and Eddie went down. Eddie went down like a like he was shot on his back and the rebound came out to Bill White and White hit the post and um, and the next shot was taken by by uh, by uh, Makita again. He hit the post. So there's Eddie laying laying down in the crease and having having two guys shoot off the post from Chicago. Oh man! Wow. And um, finally, Rod Sealing came along and cleared it down ice, and they revived Eddie. He stayed in the game, but oh, that, was, that was the, wow. that was the, the turning point in the game because they wow. could have lost it right there. Do you remember where you were sitting? Like, were you down near the ice? Were you up in the blue section? Nine row D C screen wall. That was that was that was out season tickets. I'm sorry, say uh, that again? What, what? Uh, I was in the section 439, Rosie. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Okay. They were our $3 tickets. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those days are long gone. Long gone. You can't buy it's anything like, for $3 over there. It's like now. one met, met, one Metro card trip. <laughs> so <just get> there. <laughs> that's funny. All right, Don Maloney. Now, oh, actually, before we move on to Donnie, um, I, you know, I, again, Pete's, Pete's uh, Stemmer's, like, peak years were just around the time when I started watching hockey. Okay. But, since, but since then, I've met him a few times. He's very active. He's one of those active alumni that seems to be at every event, you know, the Rangers hold. Um, he's been at, the, you know, when they had the hockey houses during the playoffs, he was there. I actually first met him at a blood drive in New Jersey. It was in Secaucus, New Jersey. And uh, he was there. He had, he still wears his uh, Toronto 67 cup ring. He's very, I mean, to, compared to like the rings of today, it looks like your high school ring, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just, 
Yeah. But he's, he loves, he's, you know, and he talked about Jerry, Terry Sawchuk and, you know, room, I guess he room with him a few times. And just, you know, it's like, it's kind of interesting because there's so many Rangers that we're, we're fans of, let's say, that we get to meet. And they, they're like lifelong, you know, they're like Kreider or, so, or Leach who played their, most of their entire career. So when you, when you see a guy who who's, shows up as an alumni Ranger but has all this back history, you know, that doesn't involve the organization, it, it's just interesting. It gives you like a totally different perspective on uh, what it's like to play, you know, in Toronto as the home team or in Toronto as the visiting team, for example. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or some of the other arenas that, yeah. you know, the current Rangers will never play in because they no longer exist or whatever. So he's just a really, really nice guy, and uh, so for what that's worth. And when he's done uh, color on the radio, filling in for Dave Baloney or whomever, he does a very good job. Yep, good point. Good point. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Speaking of Maloney yeah. brothers, <laughs> it's a nice segue. <laughs> nice segue. So this time it looks like you and me, George, picked Donnie Maloney as one of our mm-hmm. favorites. Um, I got all kinds of reasons why. I mean, this, you know, Don came up. He was he was like a rookie. You know, he, in a way, another another similarity to Kreider in the sense that you know Kreider came first thing on the scene. You know, right from college in the playoffs, and just and Maloney didn't start in the playoffs. He played what like twenty or twenty five games in seventy nine before. But then he, Don Murdoch, Espo formed this, you know, incredible line. And Maloney, over the course of his career, just became this phenomenal guy in the corners. Like when the puck went in the corner and he went in, you just, it was a given that he was going to come out with it. It just, he just seemed to never lose a battle. I remember Espo was once quoted as saying, you know, even his ears move when he's in the corner. (laughs) It's like everything, his skates were moving. I mean, it wasn't just a question of digging the puck out with his stick. And you just, he would have his feet kind of, you know, parallel to the boards and just kicking back and forth. It was, it was amazing. Actually, I remember, I remember watching him. Um, And he was a hard working guy. He was a very hard working guy. And he had a permanent five o'clock shadow. Um, (laughs) That's right. Exactly. (laughs) I forgot about that. Yeah. But he he uh, he was the first player I ever had a one on one interaction with. Like on the night before Thanksgiving, uh, in 1984, he was actually laid up at Lenox Hill Hospital with a broken leg, and uh, I that it was W it was before FAN. There was no call in shows for sports, but there was a WABC. I remember Art Russ Jr. I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he was out. He he was he was out for that show, and it was Steve Malzberg, who I think still does broadcasting. Um, and he had Donnie on, you know, remotely from the hospital. And, uh, you know, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll call. You know, I tried calling in. And I actually went into the dining room of my house in New Jersey, and my brother threw a cassette tape into the, like, we had those old-style boombox or even smaller, just a cassette radio. And he taped the whole thing, and I actually still have the tape. And, uh, you know, it came time. They, you know, you're on hold for a while. You can hear the show when you're on hold, but you're kind of waiting and, and you know, I, I was trying to think, well, what do I want to ask him? And I figured, well, I knew he and Dave are really close. So I just said, I'm just going to ask about his brother. And it was like, at the time, Dave Maloney was sort of, it was just before he got traded to Buffalo. So he was being u- not used as much. And, you know, Donnie felt really bad for him and all that. He just, it just seemed like he just kind of opened up and said, I was like, wow, this is really cool. But the one thing I re- the one thing of everything that I remember most is when they said, you know, thanks so much, you know, for talking. And he's like, thanks a lot, Mark. He actually, like, said my name at the end. And I was like, <laughs> like, he remembered my name. It was yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and I, because I was like, let's see, I was uh, 84, so I would have been like 17, 18 at the time. Wow. So it, was, it was pretty cool. Yes, it was. Yep. A lot of good memories. Of a lot of good memories. Yep. Yeah, so we have another overlap, George. It's uh, Lucky Pierre LaRouche is up next. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you well, like about you know, him? I'm concerned. Who wouldn't like Pierre LaRouche? I mean, he's, <laughs> I just, he's just, he's, he was just, just a, uh, you know, he, he was a, he was a great, uh, great uh, goal scorer. Good to have on the team. You know, Ted Sater didn't like him too much. I was just going to say and, that when you said that. I was thinking Ted Sater. Exactly. Ted Sater, yeah. But, <laughs> cool. um, and then he came back at the end of the year, and I think he scored like 20, 24 goals or something in the yep, last. Exactly, last 20 game. games. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, people who don't know, like Sater was this coach, you know, kind of came, he wasn't around very long in Rangerland, no. but uh, he managed to alienate LaRouche and Barry Beck and a lot of other people who, you know, he sent LaRouche down, I think at the time it was to Hershey. It wasn't even like our normal. It was Hershey. Right, right, yeah, right. right. It wasn't even like our normal farm team. No. And, uh, and he was the guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. So, well, I know. Uh, but, go ahead. Tom Laidlaw tells a story about that, that uh, um, in the middle of the season when the Rangers weren't doing very well and they had buried LaRouche in, in uh, Hershey, Sater said, I mean, we, we need more scoring. And he was saying, we got to get more scoring. And the other players on the team pointed out to him, he had a former 50-goal scorer sitting yeah. in Hershey. Why don't you bring him up? <laughs> And yeah. I think, if I recall, it was due to multiple injuries. He was forced to bring him up, and of course, right. The rest is history. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him, him and Mike Ridley were a good tandem. I remember the two in the play yeah. that '86 run. Yep. They, they 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 clicked a lot. But you know, Larouche was just to me. He was like a you know a previous generation of uh, Gabrick or Panarin. I mean, those guys, all of them are on my list actually. Yeah. Um, just snipe, like just made it look so easy. Came in and either a few moves or just one snap, perfect shot, top corner. You know, you just look, just look effortless almost the way. And and Larouche actually is a lot like Brad, and he was a really happy, like smiling and laughing, like oh, yep. just yep. looked like he was having a blast out there. And then he was, and he was a phenomenal player. He wasn't just like the guy who 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 broke it up and you know kept things loose. You know, he 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 was delivering too. So yeah. Which brings us to another prolific scorer yes. from the Rangers, who a Ranger coach yes. didn't have any time for, Mike Gardner. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I remember when they traded him in 94, I was furious. Yeah, me too. Anyway. Uh, he, uh, um, from from uh, my interview with uh, Neil Smith a while ago, um, um when he traded uh, uh, him, he uh, almost had to because uh, Keenan told him that, that he wasn't going to play him. He just wasn't, wasn't going to play him. So um, whatever it was about Gardner that he didn't want him on the team, uh, he was a nice guy, Gardner. So maybe that's it. Maybe Keenan didn't well, want any nice I, guy. I, I guess you're right. You're right because Leach is a nice guy and he wanted to trade him too. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I don't understand. I mean, the thing is, publicly at least, it was like you know this knock. Oh, he's not a he's a regular. You know, he had what thirty goal seasons, like fourteen seasons in a row or something. And yeah. God, he doesn't show up in the playoffs. You go back and look at Mike Gardner's stats in the playoffs. It's like he's almost and, and not just with the Rangers, like with Washington, who you know he was like the only guy on Washington for a very long time. Yeah. That, and he was still averaging just under a point per game every in the playoffs. I'm not talking to. And then, like, a goal every other game, you know. Um, I'm like, there's so many, you know, there's such a use to that. I don't understand. I had, to me, it's, the more you look at the stats, the more you think it had to be something else. It had to be either personal with Keenan or or whatever. He just, I don't know what it was. But I, I was I was surprised that he got traded for all those reasons. Also, he and Messier played together at the Cincinnati level, or Cincinnati Stingers in WHA. They had been friends yeah. forever. So that was, and so for him to get traded on a team that Mark was captain seemed very, sort of suspect yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So about it's that. Like, like you said, it must have been, it must have been just what you said. It was like, well, the only reason they're going to use he's not going to use him. Well, then you know, and you know, and, and Glenn Anderson did an admirable job. He scored. He only scored four goals or three goals, but like two of them were game winners. I mean, so you can't really knock that. It's not that he did a bad job. It's just sometimes I think, man, maybe some of those games wouldn't have gone to overtime. Or wouldn't yeah. have, you know we would have a little bit of a more cushion right. with a goal scorer like that. I mean, yeah. just so, but I can't look a gift or you know we won the cup, so it's hard to argue won the that cup. happened. But it's, it's such a bummer that he wasn't part of that. I just I, it bothers me. <laughs> it just really bothers me. Yep. Which brings yeah. us to, to to really two players that you almost have to discuss together, yeah. right? Brandon yep. Dubinsky and Ryan Callahan. Exactly, exactly. Because in, you know, 
in more recent teams, you know, these two were, were two young guys who came up the Ranger draft picks, as I recall, and they just came up and worked their behinds off, Callahan in particular. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Callahan is the only player that I've ever bought a jersey for, of, of while he was still playing. All my other jerseys, are they were already retired, you know, somebody, you know. And yeah. uh, it, it happened the night, when, you've probably seen the clip, where he blocked two shots against Winnipeg and hit somebody on the way to the bench. I mean, it was just one of these, like, incredible shifts for someone who didn't even score a goal. You were, like, on your feet for that kind of thing. Yeah. And, like, two hours later, I was on eBay getting his jersey. <laughs> I was like, and that's never, hap- that's never happened to me since. It never, I was just like, I just have to have this jersey, you know? It was one of those kinds yeah. of things. And he's yeah. just, you know, and he was a great case. Probably, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, other than Messier, he's probably one of the best captains we've had, you know, in recent yeah. memory. Just, Absolutely. you know, did everything, you know, did just – did so many things on the ice, off the ice, you know, just really solid, solid, solid yep. captain. And, and Dubinsky, you know, he had, I know, towards the tail end of his time in New York, his production dropped off. But for a while there, he was he was pretty reliable on yeah. offense as well as as well as being tough and checking and hitting guys and dropping the gloves with Ovechkin. I, mean, I was at that game when he, you know, they were we were beating yep. Caps. And Ovechkin tried to get back in the game, and Dubinsky just pummeled him. Uh, in fact, Dubinsky is the only player to have ever fought both Crosby and Ovechkin. <laughs> it's like wow. no one's ever. And, and there's that overtime game that uh, he and Callahan won against Pittsburgh. Oh, that's right. Actually, there were two. There were two games. Remember where it was a two-on-one, and one of them Dubinsky that's passed the one to Callahan for the winner. Of. Yeah. And then there was another one, like a few weeks later, where Callahan passed Dubinsky. It was like the two of them were like connecting both ways. Yeah, I do. I oh, yeah. remember that. You're right. That's right. Yeah, I remember the one against Pittsburgh. But um, Crosby doesn't have a lot of fights over his whole career, which is probably why that's a unique stat for him. But it's just funny because yep. he's the only guy who's ever, you know, probably the only one who ever will, really. Well, er- earlier in Crosby's career, he would – he had a, used to have a little Brad Marchand in him. Yeah, true. You know, poke it. Poking, you know, kicking yeah. other player skates out from under him, et cetera, et yep. cetera. Yeah, and Dubinsky like just said, I've had enough of this. Yeah, exactly. In fact, there was that, there's that one replay where Crosby dove right next to Hank, and Hank started yelling at him, and then that first guy in on him was Dubinsky. <laughs> like, yep. I could just, you know, it's just you just remember that. So. Anyway. Okay, George. All right, so when you go we're on to the is, individuals so that's, now. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that take care of all the ones where we have some overlap. Now we've got some unique choices for each of us. So. All right, I'll go down my list. Is that is that good? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. All right, I got Boom Boom Jeffrey on. It's way way in the past, 1967, uh, 1966, 67. He had had been retired for a few years from Montreal. They wanted to retire him because they wanted to add uh, Yvonne Conway onto their roster. So they took him into uh, retirement, and they gave him a job as a coach of one of their uh, junior teams. He didn't do so well. And um, and he was actually promised the uh, the uh, coaching job in Montreal, but they weren't going to get rid of uh, Toe Blake, the boom boom in there. So the boomer um, ended up with the Rangers. He came out of retirement. He... Uh, he led them to the uh, 1967 playoffs. He scored 17 goals and 25 assists, and um, he was he was one of their better players that year. And and, uh, hmm. and uh, it was it was good that you know he was one of the leaders of the team, and uh, and uh, Amo was was glad to get him. And in um, yeah, actually, Boom Boom Jeffrey was one of the first. Hockey players' names that I knew uh, when I was a little kid, a real little kid. Um, there was a Saturday afternoon game on TV, and uh, and uh, Bud Palmer, a former Nick, was doing the play-by-play, and they kept saying "Boom Boom Jeffrey on Boom Boom Jeffrey on," and um, <laughs> and then when he became a Ranger, I was thrilled. So. Um, I didn't realize he. I knew he was on the Rangers, but for some reason I thought it was the early '60s because I didn't realize he had played that late into the decade. Right. Yeah. Well, when he came to the Rangers, he was 35 years old. So uh, right. 
Right. He was um, yeah, but he he had a very good year, and the, the next year he he didn't score that many goals, but uh, he was on his last legs by then anyway. Then we have Vic Hadfield, yeah. and, and Hadfield did so many colorful things for the Rangers. He was he was their uh, captain for a while. First of all, he scored fifty goals. Um, he was the first Rangers to score fifty goals. He threw uh, Bernie Perron's mask into the crowd <laughs> in a playoff game. Yeah. Um, he climbed over the over the glass in a game at the Old Garden to save Emil Francis, who was in a fight with fans by the goal judge. Um, there's a famous picture of him with a very surprised look on his face after he went to punch one of the other players, and he ended up punching the linesman. And the linesman is laying flat on his back, and he, and uh, Dick felt this, oh my God, look on his face. Oh no! Wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, he was he was a he was a good ranger and uh he was one of the first players I interviewed for one of the first rangers I interviewed anyway. Oh nice. um, Reggie Fleming. Reggie Reggie was the guy who would make something happen out on the ice. Whenever Emil had to uh stir things up, he would tap Reggie on the shoulder and Reggie would go out and either pick a fight or knock somebody down or or um make something happen. They uh they traded uh, John McKenzie to the Bruins for him. Um, they had originally gotten John McKenzie because they wanted him to be the Reggie Fleming role. But uh, uh, McKenzie wasn't, you know, didn't want to fight. So they, they traded him for um, Reggie Fleming. All right, Teddy Irvin. I always liked Teddy Irvin. He was a, he was a, um, a hardworking guy, and he did what he... He did what he had to do, and he actually got an assist on Pete Simkowski's game-winning goal. Um, his son is a wrestler. Oh, I can't think of his name right now. Um, he's a famous wrestler, but I can't think of his name right now. Uh, but um, there's, there was a picture um, that was on the outside of Madison Square Garden of... Uh, of uh, Pete Simkowski's goal, and you can see uh, Teddy Irvin skate with the number 27 on it in the corner, <laughs> and he goes, that's, "That's my skate. That's my skate." Yeah, exactly. Good, Plus, he was he guy. was involved. Wasn't he the guy? We he was in the trade to get JD into New York, I think, when he went to St. Yes, Louis. That, in that yeah, trade, sure. that trade, they traded, they actually traded all their tough guys, um, Gary Butler, I think, and. Uh, uh, Bert Wilson and um, didn't Gene Carr go in that trade too? I don't know. Gene Carr came from St. Louis. We, we uh, oh, maybe I LA. have it backwards. We sent him to LA for Real Amu. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember him. Okay, and his Hedberg. Mm, he was he him. was the kind of guy who who you always took for granted, and when he was gone, you missed him because he was always in the right place at the right time. And um, he was he was a hell of a hockey player, and um, he you know he'll he linked forever with Alf uh, Nielsen, but um, he, he was his, his own best player. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lafleur uh, was the best deal Phil Esposito ever made. Uh, um, he was always one of my favorite players when he was with Montreal. And then when he came to the Rangers, I was thrilled, of course. And he had a, he had a good year for us. And um, it was it was nice to have Guy Lafleur on the Rangers. And uh, I was upset when he when he left after the first year. But uh, you can see his point, you know. Uh, Chris Nyland. Chris Nyland was a hockey player. Um, he 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 um, he was tough. He could score. He could go up and down his wing. And he could uh, protect his players. And supposedly he taught Igor Lieber how to speak English. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he was just he was just an all around good, good guy. All right, now come to uh, Tony Granado. Uh, when he was on the Rangers, when he first came up, he he just made everything happen out there. People loved Tony Granado, and mm-hmm. uh, he was a uh, uh, you know, almost like a beaver going all around the ice. He he he, he was 
uh, into everything, into the corners and in front of the net, everything. But then uh, in the game against the Maple Leafs, Luke Richardson banged yeah. him into the boards. And uh, yeah. he was never the same after that. And uh, so he ended up in, uh, I guess, L.A. Yep. And uh, Mike Rogers. Mike Rogers was just a fast scoring guy. He was he was very very fast, and he scored a lot of goals when he was small. He was one of the uh, the uh, Smurfs. But, um, mm-hmm. He was uh, a very good player, and uh, he was uh, much uh, appreciated when he was here because because you could always count on him to score. I don't have his numbers in front of me, but he did very well. Yeah, they were pretty high. I mean, they were like he was close to Rattel's record, or I, mean, I remember he had over 100 points, and you know. So, uh, I got a couple of things. A couple of things about your choice. Well, just I would. I feel like we should mention. And we probably know this. Yeah, that Vic Hatfield, on top of everything you mentioned, uh, wisely had his number retired at MSG. Yeah. So his his 11 is next to another number 11. So that's good. Um, Anders Hedberg, I mean, I remember against 70, in 79 against the Islanders, actually that whole run, it wasn't just against the Islanders, but L.A. and Philly. And he he, uh, he was just like a beast in the playoffs. I mean, he was this guy who, he played it so clean, you just, you kind of felt like, well, maybe he would, maybe he would raise questions how somebody like him would deal with the playoff grind. And he had, you know, no problem, thrived in those situations, scored some clutch goals for us. And then he did again in the 80s. I was at a few playoff games in the early 80s and he was scoring big goals. Um, and speaking of being at games, I was actually at the game that Gita Flores scored his only hat trick as a Ranger. Mm. It was against Glenn Healy and the LA Kings. <laughs> mm. And, you know, all I remember was the old scoreboard where on the side scoreboard it just said Gee, you know, and people were just chanting his name for like the entire, you know, the entire game. It was phenomenal. Um, Chris Nyland. You know, tough guy, obviously. You know, um, I think at one point, I don't know if it still stands, he had the most penalty minutes in one game for the Rangers. It was like 33 penalty minutes. You know, he got a, you know, two minutes, five minutes, ten, you know, misconduct, some, something happened. But yeah. he, had, he had that record for a while. And, and the other record for goals in a season by a rookie, Tony Granato, had that for a while. It was like 36 goals. I don't know. If, I don't know if like, I don't know who would have passed that. Since then, but, Murdoch, I think. Oh, well, that was after, but Tony Granato was after Murdoch. Oh, so that would that would have been that would have been after. Then maybe so, he he broke Murdoch's record. Then. Oh, oh yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, that's probably what it was. You're right. Um, but you know, Tony was a great. Tony technically is respons- partially responsible for Mark Messier coming to New York because Granato yep. and Sandstrom were traded to for um, Bernie Nichols, and then Nichols was obviously the big piece to go to Edmonton for Mark. Okay. So, so there's some, you know, two degrees of freedom. And, yeah, I remember Mike Rogers, too. Um, just one of the – I think he came from Hartford. He was like a whaler before us. He know. was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just very uh, very low-key, quiet guy who just racked up points. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to um, – Going backwards in time a little, Donnie Marshall, who the Rangers got from Montreal. Donnie Marshall won five cups with Montreal wow. in the late 50s, early 60s. And, uh, you know, he was one of the first players, I think, that uh, Emil Francis brought in as he tried to upgrade the team to make them more competitive. Was... Uh, you know, pretty pretty solid player, all around. Did a little bit of everything. Defensively responsible. Could put up. You know, was a decent mid level scorer. Was he a winger or a center? A winger. Oh, okay. Yeah, a winger. <clears throat> and you know, he was always getting in there. You know, near the net. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Then one of my other favorite players, it kind of goes with Kachuk, his other, you know, his his litter, his right-hand man there, Billy Fairburn. Mm-hmm. Speaking of guys who, when they went into the corner, they came out with the puck. He was <laughs> that guy. 
and he and Kachuk were uh, amazing penalty killers together for many years. Um, yeah, him and uh, him and uh, Kachuk out in uh, Los Angeles one night. They they held on to the puck for the whole uh, two minutes. I think of it. Yeah, of a they they were known for playing keep away with the puck once they yeah. got a hold of it. Oh wow, that's cool. And then the next guy on my list was uh, Nicky Fatio, who um, the Rangers had <laughs> after the WHA folded. They traded him to Hartford, and then he came back to New York. That's right. And uh, he was a fan favorite for a lot of reasons, simply because he was the first player from New York City to play for the Rangers. Yeah, and uh, guy had a wicked wrist shot. <laughs> yes, but that's not what he was known for. <laughs> he was he known a, for being wicked, one of the wick, toughest yeah. guys in the league. Yeah. He had a wicked right hand throwing pucks to the blue seats too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know that's where he sat as a kid. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And nobody, cool. uh, you know, nobody ever. Uh, tossed pucks up to them, so he thought yeah. it was his duty to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, I know hearing other player interviews, they all say he was a great teammate and a consummate practical joke. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> and then the last guy on my list, because I didn't want to have a million players on the list, was the current player, Chris Kreider, who we mentioned earlier as a guy joining the team in full fright, flight after winning the national championship with D.C. and then uh, coming to the Rangers and scoring important goals in the playoffs. But he's a guy whose game has changed quite a bit. He's mm -hmm. still a fast skater, but... On previous teams, they would try to hit him on the fly. He He's not like a McDavid or player like that who's got tremendous edges going full speed side to side. His speed is in a straight line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's most effective when they hit him with a pass when he's at full speed. Mm-hmm. And, of course, in recent years, he's become a machine in front of the net, tipping pucks in. And yeah. go on. Yeah, and, spe and, spe and speaking of him changing his game, I mean, that he's become a reliable, solid first unit penalty killer, which he really yep. wasn't, you know, up until a few years ago. So, uh, Well, I don't think in the yeah. NHL anybody tried to use him as a penalty killer. Right. And he apparently sort of really killed... I know he he killed penalties in college. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but I just remember thinking the guy's fast. He's got good, you know. How many shorthanded goals is he going to get, or even just chances, even if he doesn't score, and yeah. just read plays? It just made you're right. It's one of those things that makes so much sense, sort of on paper. It's like how can nobody have tried this with all these years? Well, that he's been? I I think part of it is also their success is that he and Mika Zibanejad are such a good combination together. Right. That's true, too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and Chris, uh, in addition to the 52 goals he scored, he also still has the record, I believe it's an NHL record, for the most goals scored in the playoffs before ever having played a regular season game. He scored five goals in 2012, you know, against Ottawa yep. and uh, Montreal. I, think, I forget who else we played. And... Uh, you know, but then, of course, he played, you know, didn't play a regular season game until the next fall. So uh, that's pretty, you know, pretty elite company for him. Yep. So who we got up next? The great okay. one? Uh, yeah, actually, did you want, how are we doing on time there, George? Uh, we're getting close. Uh, why don't we, why don't we stop it now and pick it up with Wayne Gretzky um, uh, part two? Okay. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. All right. We're going to uh, break for um, time here, people. Um, I'm going to uh, 
we started. We'll we'll pick up uh, Mark's text on part two. Hold on just a minute. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.